uh, why don't we get started? Uh, so when we last left off last, uh, we talked about the intensity uh, surface representation of an image. And in that, uh, we spoke specifically about grayscale. And certainly, you can talk about intensity surface for a color image. When you do so, you separate the red channel from the green channel, from the blue channel, and you traffic in the intensity surface uh, for each of those channels uh, separately. Um, so the intensity surface representation uh, has a coordinate system uh, called image coordinates, and that describes uh, the position in that 2D plane uh, for your image, uh, the position of a particular pixel. And in grayscale, we said that the pixel values can take on values from 0 to 255, all the different possibilities that you can have for value in 8 bits uh, unsigned. And uh, a value of 0 represents black. Uh, which is the smallest intensity, and a value of 255 represents white, which is the highest intensity. And so we have a bunch of uh, pixels here in image coordinates at positions x1, y1, x2, y2, uh, x3, y3, and x4, y4. And each pixel's intensity value is thought of as an elevation, if you will. And we've drawn that uh, as the intensity axis, and you could consider it the z-axis if you're thinking about three dimensions. And so when we look at the intensities of each of uh, these pixels, for example, uh, we can actually notice that here we have a darker value at x1, y1, and so its intensity or its elevation is uh, lower. Uh, here we have a lighter value at pixel location in image coordinates x2, y2, and we see the intensity, uh, uh, the elevation or intensity is higher. And so if you want to characterize uh, the content of an image computationally, uh, you do so uh, by characterizing uh, the surface uh, of that relief map uh, described by the intensity surface. And so one of the things uh, we look to uh, access or look to characterize is how flat some uh, parts of the intensity surface are, how hilly it is, how jagged, how steeply sloping it is. And so we need tools from calculus, specifically uh, the uh, derivative, uh, the partial derivative, which is a derivative with respect to one variable, uh, we use that uh, in order uh, to characterize uh, uh, the terrain, uh, if you will. Uh, and so in this particular picture, we've depicted uh, the derivative along the x direction. And let's, for the sake of consideration, consider uh, this first axis here uh, along the, along the, uh, the, the plane uh, to be the x-axis. And then let's consider the y-axis and image coordinates to be the other uh, axis where z uh, in this figure is intensity. Uh, and so here, if we imagine we're going to take a derivative with respect to x, what are we doing? Uh, we're taking a scan line that goes horizontally left to right uh, in this particular image. And as we do so, we're taking this derivative uh, along the way. And what that will give us, it'll give us the vertical edges. And so let's consider this edge here uh, along uh, the uh, left-hand edge of what is part of the doorway uh, from the original image. Uh, if you scan from left to right, on one scan line, you'll notice that it's really uh, dark and all of a sudden uh, in a very uh, short number of pixels going to the right uh, along the scan line, it goes to really, really light. And so if you were to think of that uh, transition uh, in terms of the change in the intensity surface, that would be a very steep hill, if you will, right? And that derivative is going to return to us uh, a very large value corresponding to that very steep slope. And so that's what an edge is. And you can actually compute this uh, operator. Uh, and uh, we'll actually do this today uh, the long way uh, to give you an appreciation uh, for uh, what this derivative does in the extraction of edges. But nonetheless, uh, describing the edges in an image is a so-called shape feature. Right. Uh, one way you describe uh, shape of things is by the collection of edges and specifically uh, the relative orientation of all of the edges uh, uh, for objects or associated with objects uh, in the image. Uh, so likewise, you can also compute uh, the uh, top uh, set of edges and you can also compute this uh, uh, set of uh, derivatives along the y axis. And when you do that along the y-axis, again, it's the partial derivative, but now it's with respect to variable y and not with respect uh, to variable x. And so you can imagine a scan line now going up and down in the image. And you can see this edge here for the top of the doorway from the original uh, image. Uh, you go from relatively dark pixels, and all of a sudden you go from dark pixel to really light pixel. Uh, that would correspond to a very steep hill going along the y direction or along the y scan line. And so that would be a corresponding to a horizontal edge, uh, because when you're scanning, 
uh, uh, in this uh, along the Y direction, a horizontal edge is just a collection of really steep hills. Okay, and so this derivative we can do that along x uh, and along y, and I'll actually show you uh, an example of this along x, and I'll describe at another point uh, what you can do with this. But nonetheless, if you construct uh, these, uh, can extract these edges. Um, sometimes you want to know where the steepest edges are. Those are the um, the steepest hills are. Those are the most crisp edges in your image. And so we talked about some summary statistics. We talked about the percentile. Right. Uh, if you're 90th percentile, that means um, you are greater in value than 90 percent of all the measurements. And so we can actually use uh, percentiles and many of the things that we talked about um, to uh, filter out some of the edges that we don't want. And so one of the reasons why you might want to do that, if you look at this figure, you notice here um, the edges associated with the brick pattern, uh, those edges uh, aren't as crisp. Um, as the edges associated with the doorway, right? And so those edges associated with the brick uh, pattern, um, those hills in the intensity surface are not going to be as steep as the hills associated with the doorway. And so it's very typical you're going to do some filtering, and how you can do that filtering or implement it is you extract your derivative, you have a set of hills with respect to, or local slope, with respect to every single pixel uh, in the image, uh, and then you run something like a percentile or confidence interval, uh, and you say, get me that those edge values um, that are greater at least than 90% uh, of the edges uh, in that image in terms of the strength or the steepness uh, of those uh, hills, if you will, in the intensity surface. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, so we talked about this intensity surface representation. Let's continue on, and I'm going to pull up MATLAB and probably spend um, the bulk of today uh, going over how you would implement this in MATLAB. Uh, but the setup was the so-called central difference, and we needed a way to do this and we uh, to measure the slope or the hills in the intensity surface to characterize uh, the object uh, content in the image. And uh, we said we're going to make use of the derivative, right? And so long ago in calculus, when you uh, covered the derivative, you had a definition. You said the derivative with respect to x uh, is the limit as delta x, the change in x goes to 0, of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. And so the numerator of this expression, as we said, is the rise of the function, how quickly that function changes. And for us, the function in question is this i of x, y, this intensity uh, function. Right, uh, So that's the rise in the numerator, and the run, delta x, uh, is the amount of change uh, in uh, that uh, dependent, uh, independent variable uh, for that function. So it's a function of x. And so that's rise over run. And how we're going to measure that is using the idea of a tangent line. Right? If you want the slope at a certain point, well, if you want the slope at that certain point, you use a tangent line. And how do you measure the slope of that tangent line? Well, you have to go one less than the point. Uh, for uh, that tangent line and one step greater than. And so in an image, the smallest way you can make this delta x is one pixel at a time. And so if we're dealing with so-called image coordinates and you want to know the slope at a pixel at position x, y, you're going to have to go uh, from x minus 1, comma y to x plus 1, comma y. And you're going to measure uh, the rise the increase in the intensity uh, function uh, versus the run, which is uh, two uh, pixels. Okay? Are there any questions about this? Yes? Uh, texture is a loaded word, and I'll explain why, but um, let me uh, demonstrate. And so what you're trying to do is, let's say you have an image, and I'll try my best with my artwork here. And let's say you have an intensity that's this tall, an intensity maybe that's a little bit taller, an intensity that's even taller, right? Let's say it like that. And if you wanted uh, the slope of the intensity surface at a position x, y, if this is x, comma, y uh, in your intensity surface in the center, how do you do that? Well, if you want to measure rise over run, well, do you measure rise over run going here or going here? Well, typically, when you want the derivative of a function, if you want the derivative of a function at a point, so there's my point x where I want the derivative, what do I do? 
I use a tangent line. So I say, okay, I have a line that touches my function at exactly its value evaluated at x. And this is f of x. And I have this line. And I basically have not drawn that line well. Let me do it this way. OK, so I have that point here. And I want to draw a line, a tangent line, so it only touches the function at that point f of x. And now I take the slope of this tangent line. It's run, it's rise, over it's run. So if I were to do that with the intensity surface for the image, well, I need a tangent line. So my tangent line just touches the intensity surface. Now, if I were to really draw an intensity surface, I'd have something that looks like um, my artwork is pretty bad. You can imagine almost like a sheet of paper that's bent in some way, right? That's what the intensity surface looks like. Um, and so what do I do? In similar fashion, I draw a tangent line. And so here's my tangent line, right? So I would have a tangent line somewhere touching the intensity surface. And then I say, all right, um, I look over here. Well, that's delta x. And I look to the other side, that's delta x. Well, um, delta x is one pixel, and the other delta x is one pixel. And so if I translate that idea of calling the slope at point x, the slope at uh, um, the slope of the tangent line that passes through um, f of x, um, I'm plugging in that x plus 1 and x minus 1 as the endpoints uh, of that tangent line. Does that make sense? OK. Um, it's because the function is 3D, um, I would I would not because I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, not x y, right? Um, I only care about all of the points along one line, right? Um, and then I choose another line, all the points along one line. Yes, in effect, it's a it's it's a derivative with respect to x and y because only because I'm considering different scan lines. But for a single derivative, the only variable that I'm varying it's with respect to x, not x and y, right? And so if I were to take a single scan line, so my single scan line says my intensity function might look something like this. So it's like saying take the derivative of some x, x plus delta x, x minus delta x, right? And so this derivative is along a single scan line, so it's a derivative with respect to x. It's just that I'm changing the scan line over time. Uh, algorithmically. Okay? All right. Now, to address the texture question, texture is a measure of the pattern of variation um, in intensity surface. And so let's say, you know, if we take this scan line here in the center and we were to go to the right, right, we notice it gets light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark at some characteristic rate. If we were to draw that as a function, Along that same scan line, well, what happens to the intensity? The intensity is light, so it's really high, and then it gets dark, and then it gets light, and then it gets dark, and then it gets light again. So texture is just a particular uh, repetition of a pattern of variation of changes in the intensity surface. That's different from looking at the hills. Looking at the hills says, I want to look at all of the positive or negative slopes and return back the steepest ones. A texture is a measurement of repeated patterns of, of different slopes. Does that make sense? It's a very subtle point, but it's a very important point because color, texture, um, shape are three different aspects of a larger framework of so-called uh, appearance-based features, right? And now with texture, now you could use things like co-occurrence, right? Do certain sort of slopes co-occur with one another? That's a type of texture measure. That's why there's that distinction between texture and just plain slope. You use slope uh, when you're characterizing texture because you want this measurement of repeatability of a uh, of set of patterns of slopes. OK? All right. Any other questions? All right. So we have this um, uh, version of our derivative. And this version, uh, partial with respect to x, of the intensity surface function, Ixy, that's specific uh, to images, right? 
Now, certainly, if you have a different signal, let's say you have a heart signal or you have some other type of sensor, um, how you implement the derivative is going to change based on what that delta x is and what the nature of the data is. Okay, uh, so we have this derivative with respect to x of i x y, and so if you had a way to write out this i x y in closed form, everything that involves a y is going to look like a constant and go away. Right? So literally, it's only how does it change with respect to x. And x corresponds to a scan line that's going horizontally in the image, from in image coordinates from left to right. OK, so we have i of x plus 1 comma y. Uh, we have a subtraction here. That's our rise minus i of x uh, minus 1 comma y uh, over 2. Our delta x is 2 uh, because we want to know what that run is uh, for the tangent line if we're going to measure a slope using a tangent line. And so we take this expression and we make the observation that 0 times anything is 0, right? So um, 0 does not change uh, the expression. And we just decompose this expression uh, using the first term, same denominator. So it's 1 half uh, times i of x uh, plus 1 uh, comma y minus 1 half of i of x minus 1 comma y. Right? So we have those two terms. Here's the negative one-half term, i of x minus 1 comma y. Here's the positive one-half term, uh, one-half i of x plus 1 comma y. Right? And so we're going to add a zero term uh, because we want to mechanize this uh, and be able to implement it in something uh, like MATLAB. And so we're just going to add zero. And one way to uh, write, the word, uh, write the number zero is zero times something. And so that something we multiply by 0 is going to be i of x, y, right? And so this allows us uh, to write an equivalent data structure, uh, so-called central difference mask, uh, that we're going to use to calculate the derivative, i.e. the slope of the tangent line, at a particular point x, y. And so the derivative at a point x, y, the partial with respect to x of i of x, y for that intensity surface, is the slope of the tangent line. Well, we take 0, and we multiply that by the value of the intensity at point x, y, the center point. We're not going to count that. But then we take uh, the run, which is 2, right? So that's our delta x. You see 1 half for each of the other terms. And we're going to uh, take the rise, right? So the rise is, OK, uh, the image at x plus 1 comma y, the intensity. And then we're going to subtract from that uh, the intensity at x minus y, x minus 1 comma y, OK? And so we can implement this in a data structure using a so-called convolution mask. And this is our convolution mask. And so in this mask, it's just an array, and it has three positions. And the position associated with the center pixel is going to get a value of 0. Um, the um, position with respect to x minus 1 position is going to get a minus 1 half. And we have a plus 1 half corresponding to the x plus 1 uh, coordinate. Okay, And so essentially what we're doing is we're translating this partial derivative uh, as a set of coefficients uh, that we're going to use along with the intensity value of those corresponding uh, locations. So what do we do? We take our convolution mask, and the convolution operator is nothing more uh, than multiplying one array uh, by some other uh, data structure. It could be an array, it could be a matrix, an arbitrary tensor. And so we have this convolution mask. And what you'll notice here is that the center of this mask here that has that coefficient 0 is centered over some coordinate x, y in our uh, intensity surface, right, in our image. And so what we're going to do is multiply each of the coefficients in our array of size 3 uh, by the value of the intensity surface or the pixel value for the image uh, associated with the corresponding coordinate over which that um, th uh, th uh, mask uh, is, uh, is sitting. And so here, the center value of the intensity function for this uh, position x, y is going to be multiplied by 0. And then the left-hand value is going to be multiplied uh, by a minus 1 half. And then the right-hand value in the coordinate x plus 1 right, is just to the right of coordinate x uh, in that position x, y is going to be multiplied uh, by a positive 1 half. Okay? And so you take all of those partial results. You have minus 1 half times the intensity value um, that it is over, uh, you plus uh, 0 times the intensity value of the center uh, coordinate, uh, plus 1 half times the intensity value of uh, whatever the pixel value is uh, uh, to the right of that center value. 
Does that make sense? Any questions about this? All right. So then what you do, you take that resulting sum, and then you replace the image's value with whatever that resulting sum is, that weighted sum. And then you take the mask and you slide it so that the center of the mask is now positioned over the next pixel. And then you do that calculation again, replace the pixel value for the image, and do it again, slide, do it again, 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 go to the next scan line and do it again and keep doing it for the entire image. And the resulting set of values you get for the modified version of the image will be the edge values. And that's called the ed so-called edge map. Okay, uh, so we'll take a look at this in MATLAB and actually show you uh, for a city scene uh, what those uh, edges look like when we scan uh, along X direction. And recall, scanning along X direction gives you the vertical edges, right? Because those vertical edges correspond to rapid changes in the intensity surface or the relief or the height of the relief map as you scan across, right? And so how you, those rapid changes correspond to what essentially is a vertical edge. Okay? All right. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to pop out of here, out of the slides, and I'm going to uh, bring up MATLAB, and uh, I'm going to just show you uh, the code and uh, explain a couple things. Um, it was a little bit easier to do that than to develop it uh, in real time. So, um, this is, no, that's not horizontal, that's vertical. Compute the vertical uh, edge map. Okay, so what are we going to do? So we're going to start with an image, and uh, that image um, is uh, a city scene, right? And we're going to convert it from red, green, blue, uh, from color, uh, to gray. And then I'm going to show that image, right? Uh, now, certainly, I could show you the original city Im scene uh, image, but that's not very interesting to show. All right, so let me run that. And you can see uh, the picture of that city scene, right? And so, you know, you have some buildings, you have uh, a bridge, uh, you have, you know, some windows and things like that. Now, as you can imagine, well, there are lots of vertical edges uh, in this scene. Right? There are vertical edges corresponding to these faraway buildings. There are vertical edges associated with the close buildings. And in fact, there's a very strong vertical edge here, this closest building, uh, that front uh, right-hand edge facing us. Likewise, there are edges associated with the windows, but the edges associated with the windows in these buildings aren't quite as strong as the edges uh, corresponding to the sides of the building. Right? And so you can imagine now, if you convert this to grayscale and you scan from left to right, you see you would see a large change uh, in the intensity surface value as you uh, get to that pixel associated with the edges uh, for that building. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. So let's uh, continue on uh, and quit. So we convert this uh, to gray, uh, and let me show uh, the uh, figure two. Call it figure two, and I'm going to say I am show the gray version, uh, IBW, the grayscale version uh, of uh, that same image. So I do that, and this RGB to gray, all it does is it equally weights uh, the red component, the green component, and the blue component, just as I had done in a previous lecture, uh, but I'm just using MATLAB's routine to do that. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, run that again, and we'll show the gray version, uh, grayscale version of this image. So here in figure one, that's the original image, and let me um, blow that up to make it a little bit more visible. Uh, but figure one is the color version of that city scene, which we had seen before. And figure two um, is the grayscale version. Now, when you convert to grayscale, what you're literally doing is you're taking a color as represented in the RGB color cube, and you're mapping it uh, along the diagonal. Uh, from 0, 0, 0 up through 255, 255, 255. And what grayscale is, it's an equal contribution of the red component, green component, and blue component. So if you have a color image and you want to convert to grayscale, uh, you take the red uh, saturation, you multiply it by one-third, do the same thing with the green, do the same thing with the blue, add them together, and that's your gray value. Okay? All right. So any questions about this? Uh, so looking at the grayscale uh, image, you get even more apparent 
uh, about where the edges are. If you take any um, row of this uh, grayscale image and you kind of move directly horizontally across going to the right, uh, you'll see there's a very crisp edge associated with the sides of the buildings. In addition to the windows, the window edges aren't as crisp as the building uh, edges. Okay, so now let's uh, look at uh, the creation of uh, the so-called edge map, right? And so I have a routine called Compute Edges, and I'll post all this uh, on the Blackboard alongside uh, the lecture slide. And for Compute Edges, I start out with this mask, and I literally convolve this mask uh, with all of the pixel values uh, for the intensity surface. And the intensity surface, you're thinking of the image as being a function. And that function takes two coord takes two inputs, uh, two parameters, x and y, the image coordinates, and it returns back a gray level value, uh, which is a value between 0 and 255. And so compute edges will return back the edge map. And the edge map is a new version of the image where each location, instead of containing the pixel value, um, the intensity value, it's going to contain the edge slope at that point that you would get if you used a tangent line at each point in the intensity surface. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, so here we have our mask, right? And that's the same mask that we talked about uh, when we developed uh, an expression for the derivative, right? So let me bring back up the derivative slide. So there's our derivative or partial with respect to x. And then we said that there's this uh, thing called uh, the central difference. Uh, let me go back down. I just lost this slide. Uh, there it is. The central difference, right? And we said the central difference is just a decomposition of the expression uh, for the derivative uh, achieved using a tangent line. And so we have that minus 1 half, 0, and 1 half as the coefficient values populating this mask, and this mask is an array of size 3. So here we have a mask, right? And you'll see here the minus 1 half, you'll see a 0, and you'll see a plus 1 half. And that mask is of size 3. Uh, more specifically, um, it's uh, a vector of size of rank 3. And so here, uh, we take our image, uh, and we measure its size, and I'm going to calculate the result of computing the edge mask um, by first allocating an array where that result is going to go, right? And so my result, uh, I uh, create a zero array, and the type is unsigned 8-bit integer, uh, just for some bookkeeping, right? And the unsigned 8-bit integer is what you need if you have a grayscale image. So I also create uh, a double uh, data type, and that double uh, data type is going to be a double uh, version of the image. And the reason why I do that is when you're doing calculations in MATLAB, you need to have the double data type. If you have unsigned 8-bit integer, well, unsigned 8-bit can only take on values from 0 to 255. So it's typical when you're going to do calculations, you convert to a double, so you have the full precision of double um, integers, double uh, real values, I mean, uh, uh, to do calculations. So I create a double version. Uh, of the image, right, that's passed in, uh, and I'm going to calculate the edges. So how do I calculate those edges? Well, I just said that you take this um, mask and you slide it along each row, treating each row as a scan line. So I'm going to iterate through each row. So you see here, after I took the measurements, the size of the image, I know how many rows um, that image has and how many columns. And now for each row, I'm going to scan across. What does that mean? So let's go back uh, to that um, uh, depiction of the mask uh, over the image. So if this mask is in the first row, and of course, you know, to make it look nice on the slide, it's not actually in the first row, but imagine if it were in the first row. So what do I do? I start out with the center part of this mask in the first coordinate uh, for the first pixel. And then I calculate something, and then I slide it one to the, to the right. And then I calculate something, slide it one to the right. So certainly, for the first row, I'm going to iterate through all of the columns uh, in the image. Okay? And so here, I have a double loop. Uh, here, for the outside for loop, uh, that's going to get me the first scan line, and then the second scan line, and then the third scan line. So I iterate through all of the rows uh, in this image. You can think of a row as a scan line. And now, column, when I iterate through the columns, I'm essentially moving the position of the center of this mask of size 3 so that this 0 uh, value is centered over 
uh, that coordinate encoded by rows, uh, comma, columns. Does that make sense? And so literally, I'm going to take this mask and I'm going to calculate something, move it to the right. Calculate something, move it one pixel to the right. Calculate something, move it one pixel to the right. Okay? So in my iteration uh, for columns, well, there's something um, that happens. Now, of course, when we look at the mask, if I put the center position of the mask at position 1-1 one, one in the image, something weird happens. And there are two different things you can do, but I'll first describe uh, what that weird uh, thing is. So let's say you have your image. And so this is my image. And I have my mask. And let's say my mask is here. Now, in order for my mask to be centered over position 1, 1, right? Now, of course, in MATLAB, everything starts as ones-based indexes, right? So it's 1, 1. If you were to use Python or Java, it'd be 0, 0, right? Uh, so if I have my center position, remember, it's minus 1 half, 0, 1 half. If I have this mask at position 1, 1 uh, in my image, well, what happens? Well, this left-hand part, the minus 1 half, that's kind of hanging off the edge. Right? And so if I'm going to calculate something using intensity surface, well, the intensity surface is not defined where I have that minus one half part of my convolution mask. So I have to do something. And there are two things you could do. Um, one thing you could say is, OK, don't ever get into that situation. So if you don't ever get to that situation, that means the mask will always be centered over position 1, 2. Right? You're going to ignore that first column. Right. Uh, and so that's what I chose to do here. But another alternative is if you have this mask hanging off the edge of the image, uh, you can um, give it a default value like zero or some average or, or, or what have you. Right. And so it's really up to you how you decide to do that. But for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to take this latter approach where I don't allow it to hang off the edge. And I just substitute a zero later on because that's how I initialize uh, my result. Okay? All right. So, any questions about that? No? All right. So, let's go back to the code. And if you look for my columns, I say if the column is equal to one, just continue. Keep iterating. Ignore the first column. And I can do that because when I create a double version, I'm going to end up setting everything to zero as a default. Right? Um, okay. So, I ignore the first column. So my mask is never hanging off the edge. Likewise, when I iterate through my columns, you'll notice my last column is columns minus one, right? Uh, the converse, the other rather scenario, is that I can have my mask, remember my mask is always centered, the middle of the mask is centered at each coordinate uh, in the image. So the other situation that I can have is that if my mask is centered at that maximum uh, column, right? Some row and some column. Well, that right-hand side of the mask that has the coefficient positive one half, it's going to hang off the edge. And so in this case, again, I'm saying, don't allow it to do that. I want to center it up to columns minus one, right? So it never hangs off the edge, OK? All right, any questions about this? All right. so. That handles the part about the mask um, hanging off of where the intensity surface is not defined, right? Um, and so I do that by ignoring if it's column one, and I only go up to column uh, whatever the max number of columns minus one, whatever that is. Okay, so now I'm actually going to perform the multiplications for the convolution. Well, my mask has three positions. Uh, the first position is going to have coefficient 1 half. The second position, which is the center position, is going to have coefficient 0. And the third position is going to have coefficient 1 half. So I take that first coefficient of minus 1 half, I multiply it by whatever the image value is um, to the left of the center value. right? So here I have less mask, uh, the mask uh, first position. That's minus 1 half. I multiply for given I'm in row and column in image coordinates. I say the same row, but whatever the current column is, column minus 1. Okay? Uh, that's like saying x minus 1. Okay? Likewise, the center position, you'll notice I multiply that center position of the mask, which is mask 2, 
which happens to be a value of zero, and multiply that by whatever value I have in the intensity surface, my image pixel value, at position row comma column. That's like saying zero times i of x, y. Okay? And then likewise, the third position of the mass, I'm going to multiply that um, by whatever the intensity surface is at row comma column plus one. That's like saying i of x plus one uh, uh, comma y. Now you notice here, when I have my image, I say row column, right? And that's something that you get used to sometimes when you're dealing with images. Now the row is the y value, right? And the column is the x value. But when you access an array, a 2D array, when you access a matrix, you say row comma column. And you notice you're used to saying x comma y, but here it's y comma x when you're accessing the image, right? So it's really important to remember the difference between the order of the axes when you're dealing with mathematical coordinate systems versus you're dealing with image coordinate systems. Does that make sense? Because the row always gets you up or down in an image, which looks like y, and the column always gets you left and right in an image, which looks like x. But you're used to saying x comma y. Here, it's row comma column. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? So it's really important to remember that the order uh, flips, if you will, when you're dealing with images. OK, so now I take my result as my resulting image value. This is going to be now uh, the slope of that particular tangent line uh, for that location of the intensity surface at the center value, right? And so I add those three things. I add the left part, the center part, and the right-hand part. And I call it an unsigned 8-bit integer. Right? because I want to treat it like it's an image. And the reason why I'm treating it like it's an image is because I actually want to draw for you an image that depicts uh, all of the edges. Okay? All right, any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. And so certainly when you're doing this for real in MATLAB, I mean, you'll have an assignment where you just get used to doing this, uh, but there's a convolution uh, function in MATLAB that does it for you, right? But it's really important to understand what convolution is before you can use the APIs in MATLAB. Similar fashion, you know, you have to know what addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are before you use a calculator, right? Okay, so we save that result, and then we move to the next column. And essentially what that's doing is taking that mask and considering the next pixel uh, to, the, to the right. So it's just changing your X value, uh, and it's uh, continually calculating the slope using the central difference uh, at each of the pixels uh, along a single horizontal scan line. Does that make sense? All right, any questions about this? Okay, so when we're done with that, we call our result our so-called edge map, right? Uh, and so this edge map is a set of slopes where each slope is calculated on a per pixel basis. It's the slope of the tangent line centered at each pixel value, at each uh, coordinate in the intensity surface in the original image. OK, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use percentiles. And this is going to give you every edge. And we just got done saying, if you look at the image, I probably got rid of the images. Yeah, I did. Um, some of the edges are really strong edges, corresponding to the sides of the buildings. And some of the edges are very weak edges, right, corresponding to the windows. So now what I want to do is I want to say, only show me the edges that are greater in their, in, in their slope, if you will, the strongest edges. Give me uh, the top 10% edges. Another way of saying that is given all of the edges that I have in the image, Give me those edges, only show me those edges uh, that are greater than at least 90% of all the edges in the image, right? And so we're going to use percentiles to do that. And so how do I do that? Okay, I take my edge map, and I'm going to do what's called flattening uh, that, uh, that uh, edge map. So I start out, and I have a matrix. And that matrix, uh, the edge map, is the same size as the original image, uh, but in the edge map, each of the quote-unquote pixel values is a slope, right? Uh, so it's going to be a slope value. And so when I say reshape, what I'm doing is I'm taking all of the rows of the edge map and I'm laying them out one next to the other next to the other to make a continuous strip, really long single vector uh, containing 
all of the values from each of the rows of the uh, edge map. Does that make sense? And so I'm flattening it. Why am I flattening it? Because I want to calculate something from it. And it's a lot easier to calculate something from it uh, if it's been flattened. Okay. So I flatten the edge map, and then I compute the 90th percentile, right? Uh, PRC tile, right? I flatten it, right? So the edge map contains all the edge uh, values or all the slopes. And then I say, get me the value that is larger than 90% of all of the edge values. So get me the 90th percentile uh, slope uh, of the intensity surface from all those slopes that I have. Once I do that, I then say, okay, well, create what's called a mask. And what a mask is, here you'll notice inside this parenthesized expression on line 39, I say edge map greater than X90. X90 is the 90th percentile value. So what it's going to do when I say edge map greater than X90, it's going to compare every um, edge value, right, every slope in this edge map against the 90th percentile element. And if it's greater, it's going to return a true. If it's smaller, it's going to return a false. Okay. Well, why do I do that? I basically want to identify true or false. Are you slope at that particular position, are you greater than the 90th percentile or are you less than the 90th percentile? If you're less than, you're going to get a zero return back from that Boolean comparison. If it's greater, you're going to get a one. So what that does is it identifies, right, in each position of the image, those pixels associated uh, with a slope in the intensity surface that's greater than 90% uh, of all of the others. Does that make sense? And so now, given the result of that edge map, that mask, I can now plot that mask and actually show you which what those edges are. Okay? All right. And so I return back that new edge ma uh, map mask, which are the 90th percentile ones. So let me start out. In a stand of 90th percentile, I'm going to return back the 0th percentile. And it doesn't make sense. It's um, essentially the smallest one, right? And when I say 0th percentile, I'm basically showing you all the edges uh, in the image. OK? All right. So let's save that. Let's go back to test edge map. And we're going to compute the edges. And I'm just going to show what that edge map looks like. OK? All right. So let me call that figure 3 when I do that. Figure 3. All right. So let's try this out and see what happens. So again, we have the original image. And let me continue. Uh, and let me minimize this. So figure one is the original image, right? That's our color image. Let me increase the size of that so it's more visible. So there's my original image. It's color city scene color, uh, in, in RGB. I have the grayscale equivalent of it. Um, and that's from my RGB to gray. And now, figure three, this is the set of all uh, of the vertical edges. Now, if you notice, gosh, that's a little bit busy, right? There's a lot of stuff there. I see all the edges. You can see the windows in this front building. Uh, you can see um, a lot of detail uh, from that roadway, uh, it looks like. Let's see. Uh, there's like a walking path. You see the edge where the water meets the, meets the, uh, meets the land. Uh, there's like a walking path. You can see those edges. You can see the edges of the window. You can even see the horizontal edges for the clouds. If you scan left to right in this um, RGB or grayscale image, uh, you can see the edges uh, associated with where uh, the cloud color changes um, the pixel values as you go from left to right uh, in the sky. Now, of course, showing you all the edges is not necessarily helpful, right? Uh, so I'm going to change uh, this percentile setting. Uh, and I'm going to make it a little bit more conservative instead of saying show all the edges, show those edges that are greater than some percentage of uh, the uh, edge intensities, as it's called. And that intent edge intensity corresponds to the steepness of the slope. So I'm saying show me those edges corresponding to um, slopes that are greater than, say, 90% of all uh, the slopes in the end intensity surface. So I'm going to go back to compute edge. And now, instead of the 0th percentile, I'm going to go up to the 90th percentile. So I'm going to save that, and I'm going to rerun uh, the test of my edge map. Uh, let me uh, save, and I'm going to rerun that. So let me continue. And now if I do it, uh, we take a look at what happens. So again, I have my original color image here, 
right, as expected. It's the city scene. I have my grayscale uh, version of it uh, converted using RGB, counting the red, green, and the blue parts equally. And let me uh, maximize or make it really big uh, the resulting edge map. So you notice here, that's my 90th percentile edge map. And so it's certainly gotten rid of uh, a lot of the cloud cover. It's represented um, where the, sh the water meets the, uh, meets the land, those edges, those, horizontal, uh, those vertical edges. It also, some of the walkway. And now you see um, a lot of the windows are starting to go away, but certainly the outlines of the buildings are, starting, are, are, are remaining. Now, certainly I could kind of tinker with this and I could, you know, maybe instead of 90th percentile, maybe I go to 98th percentile and we'll see what happens. Uh, so I start out with 98th percentile. So now I have the top 2% uh, strongest edges uh, in the image that are represented in the edge map. So let me, oops, oh, this is, I need to run the test routine. All right, that's a function. There we go. So let me run that and continue. And let me just cut to the chase and show you the resulting uh, edge map that has been filtered. And so if we do this, you'll notice most of the walkway goes away. Most of the windows go away. And we're left primarily uh, with the prominent edges corresponding uh, to the edges of the side of the building, okay? The sides of the buildings. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? So what can you do with this? Well, we can certainly extract the vertical uh, edges using uh, the derivative with respect to x. We can extract the horizontal edges using the derivatives uh, with respect to y. And we can actually combine them and do all sorts of things. Right. Um, we can combine the X and Y, and I'll demonstrate that another time, and get uh, the true edge intensity. Uh, but we can also, with the edge intensity with respect to X and Y, we can also get the orientation or the angle at which each egg, edge occurs. Right. And so given that orientation, you can now describe more suitably uh, the, uh, the shape of some object uh, that's depicted uh, in an image. OK. All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? And so again, in MATLAB, uh, there's an actual convolution uh, operator, and it'll do the convolution for you instead of looping as I have done uh, and um, doing this multiplication at each location in the intensity surface. And MATLAB will do it for you. But it's important to understand um, how it works, uh, because some of the parameters you can set uh, are the default behaviors it gives you when that mask um, uh, is outside of the intensity surface. And some options are to uh, input a default value, some are to pad it with some default value, some are to ignore it, and so forth. Okay? All right. Any questions? Does that make sense? Um, so I will certainly post this uh, on the Blackboard, and I encourage you to, to tinker with it um, uh, at your, at your uh, leisure. All right. Uh, so let's go back uh, to the slides, and I believe that was everything for uh, that module. Okay, uh, so I'm going to bring up uh, the next module, and I don't expect uh, to get through uh, all of it, um, but certainly will probably end uh, before the MATLAB portion uh, for this module, because I don't want to break that across two different uh, class meetings. All right, so... We just talked about the color uh, representation, RGB, and you can take all of the possible mixtures of red, green, and blue to form the different uh, colors. Uh, it forms a cube. And any location in this cube, uh, the projection along each of these axes represents uh, the amount of saturation it's called for red, the amount of saturation for green, the amount of saturation for blue. And we showed using a web browser uh, the background color, uh, and we showed different uh, colors that you can synthesize um, using all the possible mixtures of red, green, and blue. And in this uh, particular representation, uh, the saturation can go from, two, uh, from zero, meaning no saturation, up through 255, uh, which means full saturation. And if you look at all the gray level colors, going from white uh, up to black uh, up to white, um, each of the gray level values represents an equal mixture or saturation of red, green, and blue components. And therefore, uh, the collection of different grayscale values are represented as values along the diagonal in, in the RGB color cube. Okay. Uh, so we talked about that. And uh, we talked about the intensity surface. And we said uh, that uh, the shape, or characterizing the shape, or the terrain of this relief map 
uh, as it were, uh, tells you about the content uh, of the images. Uh, and then we also uh, had our MATLAB example uh, using something that looked like confidence intervals. You could also use percentiles. Uh, we took our definition of the derivative. Uh, we computed that derivative uh, for uh, images uh, for the intensity surface in an image. Uh, we derived uh, the central difference, and then we demonstrated uh, convolution uh, using MATLAB and the impact of using confidence intervals or, or uh, percentiles uh, to filter out uh, the so-called weak edges, and you can see the result uh, of that in the edge map. Okay, so let's look at some issues uh, pertaining to correspondence. We talked about correspondence uh, as a really important uh, thing in computer vision, and we said correspondence is the finding of an object in one image uh, within another image. We showed all sorts of useful things people are doing with correspondence from optic flow uh, to 3D stitching and 3D instant replay and uh, depth uh, recovery or calculation of depth uh, using uh, two camera assumption. And so here we have um, this image that we've been carrying forward and we have uh, two scenes and the assumption is at time t0 the camera was at one position and at time t1 the camera moved to the right. And as you move a camera to the right, the stuff that it is imaging uh, goes whooshing uh, to the left. And so we take an image, we move the camera, we take another image at time T1. And so one question we might ask is where did this uh, pink uh, cropped region uh, for the doorway, where did it go from time T0 to T1? Now certainly with the human eye, the naked eye, you can easily uh, find this, but from the perspective of a computational system, it has to search for it because it doesn't know, right? Uh, certainly there are certain constraints you can apply uh, to make this search easier, uh, but let's just consider uh, for the sake of today um, some of the issues associated uh, with actually calculating these correspondences. So um, our function uh, should measure some notion of similarity in appearance. Now the similarity, you could look at the uh, similarity between the edge maps, you could use the similarity between raw pixel values. Now certainly similarity between raw pixel values, it'll certainly work, but it's not necessarily your best option. So nonetheless, you have some similarity measure. And so here we have this pink uh, cropped region uh, that we got out of the image at time uh, T0. Uh, and it's uh, the region corresponding uh, to that doorway. Uh, and we have a bunch of candidates uh, at time T1, which we think uh, might be where uh, that doorway went uh, when the camera moved. And so we measure similarity, and we talked about um, correlation as one measure uh, that we can use. And so going back to some review, we have um, the mean mu uh, is our uh, expected value of a variable. It's a probabilistic weighted sum. If we have a set of measurements, we use the sample mean. Uh, it's a great replacement uh, for the population mean, so we can go forward with that uh, from actual samples. We also have the variance, and we showed uh, in a homework, uh, we had an assignment where we talked about um, whether or not the sample variance is uh, biased or unbiased, consistent, or inconsistent. But nonetheless, the variance is a measurement of dispersion, that is how far away each measurement, in this case pixel value, is uh, from uh, the mean. And so we make a probabilistic weighted sum of the difference of the magnitude uh, between uh, each measurement uh, and uh, the mean. And we can take this variance, take the square root, and that's our standard deviation. And again, the standard deviation um, gets around this issue uh, uh, that you have with variance uh, because the units are squared uh, when we talk about variance. Okay, uh, so uh, covariance is a linear dependence between two variables. And we talked about that last semester, but at a high level here, uh, we have the difference between X and its mean, one variable, and we have another set of measurements that would be the pixels from another image or the image at time T1, Y. We take that difference between each of those Y uh, measurements and its mean. And then we have the joint probability distribution as that weight. And so we talked about this relationship uh, from two examples. Here we have uh, one graph here on the left-hand side, economic growth, and um, uh, it's versus on the horizontal, on the vertical axis, stock market returns. As an economy grows, um, companies make more money, they become more valuable, and that is reflected by increased share price. And so uh, the stock market uh, returns are going to increase because those stocks are now uh, higher share price. Uh, likewise, for gasoline, 
as you have uh, increased oil production, uh, supply and demand dictates, and so more oil uh, means cheaper gas. Uh, gas is derived from oil, and if you have uh, more gas on the market being sold, then certainly the price goes down. All right. So in the first case, uh, this is a positive uh, uh, covariance or positive relationship, a unit step increase in one variable economic growth uh, leads to a unit step increase in the other variable, uh, namely the stock market return. And likewise, uh, the second graph uh, represents a negative uh, covariance, or you could say negative correlation. Um, uh, as a unit step increase in oil production occurs, there's some unit step decrease in the gas price. As one goes up, the other goes down. Uh, so correlation um, is uh, a standardization, if you will, um, of covariance. Um, because for covariance, uh, you have the multiplication of two different units, and it's kind of nice uh, to have it on something, a scale that almost looks like a percentage. It's not really a percentage. But nonetheless, uh, for correlation, you take your covariance, and you divide covariance by the product of two things, namely the standard deviation of the x variable and the standard deviation uh, of the y variable. And so correlation uh, ranges uh, between minus one and plus one, uh, where plus one is perfect positive correlation and minus one is perfect negative correlation. Okay, any questions about this? All right, so we have our correlation. And so if we were trying to find a correspondence, we have our original pink cropped patch from uh, the image at time t0. And then for each candidate patch that we're going to compare it to, we would literally uh, run this correlation uh, between all the values associated with the patch we'll call f from the original image at time t0 and each one of these candidates g. Uh, in this case, I've only drawn four of them, uh, but we literally would compute that correlation uh, between uh, F and each one of these uh, candidates uh, G. And so the correspondence is the patch uh, of intensity surface that maximizes the similarity measure. So in this case, it would be the one that maximizes the correlation. Now, certainly for this example, we'd be looking for positive correlation because negative correlation doesn't make sense unless one image were the negative uh, of the other, right? Uh, and that would certainly, you'd look for negative correlation. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're after uh, the largest positive correlation. Okay, uh, so let's uh, take a look at this. So we select a query, and let's call this uh, pink cropped region, let's call that the query. And now we need to find where in uh, the image at T1 that this query is going to be associated with the highest match score, in this case, the highest correlation. And so we're going to do this by searching. So we're going to initialize a search, right? And here, you notice I've started that search with this dotted version of uh, the pink box uh, in the image uh, at time t1. And so we initialize our search. We start with the query. We initialize our search. And we crop out that region from our search. And then we compute our correlation. And we get a value, right? And so we then update. Uh, our, we, we keep our query, right? We maintain it, and then we update our uh, search here. So you notice here, uh, this uh, dotted version of the box, it moves. Uh, we update the search, and then we crop again. And we now compute our correlation again, make another cor uh, uh, comparison between this updated search that we've cropped uh, and the original query, and we get yet another value. And so we keep doing this, and this is the basis of our search algorithm, we initialize a query, and then in a loop, we crop uh, some region uh, from uh, the image at time t1, we make a comparison, we save uh, the match score, and then we update the location uh, from where we're cropping, where we're doing our search. Okay? Any questions about this? No? Make sense? Okay. So it's fairly straightforward, uh, but we have an interesting trade-off, right? We have a trade-off between granularity i.e. how fine-grained you can uh, locate a patch in the image at time t1 uh, and performance. So let's take a look at this. So suppose we were to tessellate um, this uh, image at t time t1, meaning to slice it up into non-overlapping sections relative to the search window. Uh, now certainly if we did this, we get pretty good performance because we don't have that many um, different uh, candidates to search and do the comparison. But the problem is, is that we have relatively low resolution. We can only find candidates that are specifically on boundaries uh, for this search window, right? 
Um, okay, well, it's fast, but it's not as accurate. So let's say uh, we shifted our search window and let's say they were overlapping and the smallest way you can get the search window overlapping is to only shift it one pixel at a time. Now, certainly given the size of the image, as you get more and more high definition, there are going to be many more pixels, a higher resolution uh, in this uh, T1 uh, version of the image. Now, of course, if you're moving one pixel at a time, Yes, you can precisely identify uh, where this original red cropped region uh, at time t0, where it moved at to at time t1, but it's going to take you a relatively long time to do that because you have more search candidates. Many more times you're going to be cropping and comparing and then moving and then cropping and comparing and moving. And so what is the right, uh, you know, those are the two extremes. What is the right approach? Well, it depends on your application. If you're interested in raw speed, well, <clears throat> perhaps something that's tessellated might uh, do the trick. If you're more interested in accuracy and you can afford the time or you have the computation available, then perhaps uh, something like this overlapping uh, by just one by by shifting one pixel might be the right approach. And it really is dependent uh, on the application you have, what's important uh, for your end application. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you have overlapping um, search regions, it's higher resolution, but it's much uh, more slow uh, to do the search. Okay. Uh, another thing you can do is you can have constraints. So here we have um, the image at time T0, and we know the cropped region that we're trying to find. And I've drawn some um, coordinates, a coordinate system, using these gold arrows. And we know the position uh, of the center of this cropped region at time t0. Uh, we know that position in the image. Now, certainly, if you know the time difference from t0 to t1, let's say it was like, you know, maybe 100 milliseconds, right? Uh, and let's say you know how fast the camera was moving. Well, if uh, the difference was 100 milliseconds uh, between T0 and T1, these two images, uh, and you know that the camera was moving no more than, I don't know, 10 miles an hour, someone, well, people can't run 10 miles an hour, someone's walking with the camera, um, 18 miles an hour is world record uh, 50 meter dash speed. So um, something like three or four miles per hour is reasonable for someone walking with a camera, right? Uh, so let's say someone's walking three or four miles an hour and the difference between T0 and T1 was 100 milliseconds, you know that stuff in the image couldn't have moved more than a certain distance, right? Just based on physics. And so in that case, using constraints, uh, other pieces of information, like the speed at which the camera was moving and the, the time difference between uh, images that were taken, uh, instead of searching the entire image, you can just search a region based on those physics assumptions. So what do you do? Okay, we have the position of the image at time t0, uh, the position of the crop region at time t0, and we have those coordinates in image coordinates, and we know the constraints at which the camera moved. And so given those constraints, we compute what's called an uncertainty region, right? Uh, we know from time t0 to t1, t that red cropped region that I've marked here in the second image, t1, at t1, couldn't have, uh, that thing couldn't have grown, or that, uh, that, that search window, the objects in it, uh, the, the patch, I mean, uh, couldn't have moved uh, any further than that blue box around it. And so using constraints like that, instead of searching the entire image, you only search within that blue box because the laws of physics tell you that it couldn't have traveled more than a certain distance, uh, plus or minus around its original location at time t0. Does that make sense? And so with tracking, that's usually what happens. And with these constraints, you can more exhaustively at a fine grain level search in a smaller region uh, of the image and try to strike a balance between this idea of speed and uh, high level of granularity. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, yeah, okay. Um, so you can balance things uh, using uh, these constraints and that's usually what happens in, in practice. And if you ever see these applications where you know they draw a bounding box around something that's tracked, maybe we should try that experiment in here. Um, uh, that's, that's basically what they're doing. Okay, uh, so 
I was going to try this in MATLAB, um, but um, I don't think I want to try in MATLAB. We're here till 1045, so that's 38. Yeah, we don't have enough time. Um, seven more minutes. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll end here, uh, and we'll pick back up with this on Tuesday uh, in MATLAB, and we'll actually show you an example uh, of this uh, and show you uh, the, these trade-offs. Maybe if I can get a live camera tracking happening, um, maybe we'll do that. We'll see. I can't promise you that. Uh, we'll see what Raspberry Pi can do. All right. Uh, so I will see you all on Tuesday. Ah, almost forgot. Uh, so, um, uh, oh, brain hiccup. What was I going to say? Today is the 13th, and on the calendar, um, we have uh, midterm week is next week. And so I'm contemplating having an actual exam uh, in this class on Thursday, a week from today, which would be during midterms. Uh, but if you're in my networking class, which is right after this, um, I'm going to have the midterm for that probably a week later to kind of stagger things. Uh, but we have enough in this class um, for uh, a, a, a written exam number one. And um, so it'll cover uh, fair game is everything we've done up to this point. And so a great way to review is to understand all the stuff we've talked about. Certainly the screencasts are there. Um, and also, um, you know, stuff that I ask on the exam would be stuff that would be related to, but certainly easier uh, than stuff that was on the homework, because certainly, you know, you only have an hour and 15 minutes uh, on an exam. And so if you can do the material up to this point, uh, you should be fine. It will be a thought exam. And as you can probably appreciate, it's really hard uh, without having, you know, code and doing analysis uh, for testing for a class like this. But it'll be something where you will have to look at data, you'll have to interpret data, and you have to make a reasoned uh, judgment about uh, what the problem is asking you based on that. It won't require a calculator. Um, I never do that in my exams uh, for this class. Uh, and um, it'll basically fair games everything we've covered thus uh, thus far. Okay. All right. Any questions? I mean, if there is a math problem, it will not require you to compute a numerical solution. That you know, you know, what is uh, you know, one o two seven divided by divided by thirteen. You know, I won't do something like that. Um, anything that would have a number, bless you. Uh, would be something that would result in like two over five, you know, so you won't need a calculator. You certainly won't need MATLAB. Um, I could ask you a MATLAB question, but it will be conceptual and not, you know, write the MATLAB to do this because I don't expect you to memorize all of the MATLAB API calls. Okay.